Bienvenidos sean todos ustedes, welcome everybody, don't worry, uh, the rest of the show is going to be in English, el resto del show va a ser en inglés, entonces para que se preparen, and the reason, uh, the, the reason why we're having uh, this, this discussion in English and not in Spanish, unless the, the guests uh, want to, to practice his, his Spanish, is because we have a really special guest, he's the director of one of the films that I really enjoyed the most, that I watched last year, and actually it's included in, in the Cinefil Cinefiles, the dossier where we combine the best of what we have watched here in Mexico by legal means, legal means, I have to uh, specify, and uh, I'm really glad that we have uh, joining us Ryan Prowse. How are you doing, Ryan? Hey, thanks for having me on. No, it's, it's a real pleasure. And uh, well, perhaps Ryan will be like a newcomer. Perhaps you haven't uh, heard about the work that he has done. But believe me, for his uh, Opera Prima, for his first uh, feature film, uh, I found it that it's uh, something really attractive, something with uh, a lot of punch and with a lot of interesting ideas. Some that might be familiar, especially if you are in the frontier, in, in the, at the southern border in, in the United States. Or in my case, if you are Mexican, you will recognize some of the fig figures that uh, are being in there represented, perhaps not directly, more like a tribute, more like references. But uh, first of all, uh, Ryan, can you tell us a little bit uh, what is the deal with the low life? What is it about? Yeah, yeah, it's a, like a multi-narrative uh, crime film set in Los Angeles. Uh, we follow like different characters on the end of a, um, of a heist or like a kidnapping gone wrong and all the trouble that ensues with sort of like colorful characters. We, we have a uh, luchador and, I don't know, a luchador killing the shit out of ice people, basically. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, for example, you, you have, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, uh, some different storylines that uh, are being worked in there. Uh, four stories, if I'm not mistaken. Four or three? Uh, it's like three main characters that kind of all circle around like the bad guy. Exactly. And uh, some of them are, are really representative. And uh, one of the things that I like the most is, is the way that you handle the stories. Uh, as uh, we were looking, uh, it's in here, as we were, we were looking some of the scenes of the, from the trailer, from the promotional material, we see some of these colorful characters. Uh, one that I really love is uh, this guy that has a, just a swastika in his, um, in his face. And uh, uh, the way that you deal with elements that uh, might seem inappropriate, but actually they have... It's, it's not just the facade, it's, it's something more about them uh, that you always have in there. Also, and we can look uh, there at, uh, at your office, at your place, some of the other uh, main characters. In this case, we have El Monstro. So yeah. let's talk a little bit. Let me put it in on, on full Senior. screen. <laughs> yeah. How, how many characters are in the, in the Monstro uh, family? Because uh, we here, obviously, we have the current generation and yeah. we, we are looking for the upcoming that hopefully will clean some of the, I don't know, the, of the disgrace that have come with the, the current generation. But uh, you also talk uh, about the, his father and his grandfather, right? The original monster was a grandfather. Yeah, we were always kind of like tracking like, you know, like the storied legacy of, of like a wrestling family from probably like the 40s or so. So definitely there's a grandfather and a father and uh, our current monstro, is, as you said, is disgraced. And uh, hopefully the uh, the uh, the youth, the monstro Nino will uh, will. <laughs> Uh, set the family back right <laughs> he said the monster niño i love the the reference yeah. in there well if we have the santo niño and uh, you can add uh, any kind yeah. of reference as well you can have yeah. the and uh, one of the the most powerful imaginary this this you can uh, get guys if you go to lowlifethemovie.com which is the official page for in this case uh, you can uh, see some of the of this the scenes and i love use the powerful imaginary because you are mixing in this case uh, like uh, an altar of uh, day of the dead Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, because it's, it's, a, it's a place where El Monstro pays his respects to the previous generation. So can you tell us a little bit about the, in this case, since we're uh, talking about the Monstro, uh, about the references that you had for this character? Yeah, well, I mean, definitely, as you mentioned, like, you know, Santo, uh, our uh, Blue Demon, like, our, it, like, these guys are like, you know, 60s, 70s films. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, there were there were a, 
five writers total on the film. And we all, a bunch of us just really like the, uh, those old Santo movies that were like, you know, I'm sure some of your audience knows of it, but they're like, he's a wrestler by day and then he fights, you know, werewolves and mummies and whatever by night. And, uh, <laughs> so the idea of like putting that guy into a really heavy I believe Los so. Angeles right. crime film was kind of too good to pass up. Yeah, and for example, this is one of the other things that I want to, to tackle. But before that, perhaps some background will be will be needed. And I, I, the first time that I heard about your work, and uh, you actually can watch this legally and free online, it was uh, for a, a short film, an award-winning short film actually, called Narco Corrido. And from here we can see some of the some of the characters, some of the development, and part of the elements that you are actually um, using once again in low life. So can you tell us a little bit about your story and the relationship that you have with this kind of, in this case, the, the southern border in the United States, this kind of story? Yeah, yes. yeah I'm, I'm, from, uh, I'm from Atlanta, from Georgia, so I'm not even really super from the Southwest, but it wasn't until I came out um, to Los Angeles for, to go to school, and uh, Narco was our, um, our thesis film at school. And it wasn't until, you know, like the, the thing about the narco is I really uh, like and respect. I mean, it feels very of a kind to, uh, to like outlaw country or obviously like the comparisons have made to like gangster rap or whatever. Uh, so when I got out here, I, I had heard this stuff before, but I didn't really know too much about it until I moved out to LA and um, had a chance to, to hear some of the music and kind of learn about it, it, about the, the world. And um, they do a lot of the recording here in LA actually. So that was kind of just interesting uh, to get into. And this was done back in, let's see, we shot in 2011. So, I mean, it's been a little bit um, that I've just been kind of curious about that world. Uh, and yeah, I, it's funny, it's like, like what is the idea or like kind of the overlapping thing. I just, I really, I, I like, like, it's such a, I mean, it's obviously like a Mexican tradition, uh, you know, folk music, but I love the idea of like, um, it becoming such an American like form of music and form of storytelling. Uh, but it's kind of suppressed and no one really kind of considers it that, but it's such a big, uh, genre here in the, in, in, a, in the U.S. So that to me just felt like a really interesting way into kind of, yeah, the border politics and border story um, and doing that as like a folk tale or a folk song. And same thing with Low Life just felt like um, we deal with like ice and we deal with uh, sex trafficking and everything in the, in the film. But like, you know, it's, it's like finding like the entry point to the story with people that aren't normally represented uh, in films and like that being, you know, like to me, the important way in or the, the way to kind of like, I can actually then connect to that story, connect to that character and then kind of go on the journey from there. Of, like it just being something like a point of view that we haven't seen a ton mm -hmm. in, in film. So I think if anything, those are kind of the two connecting points between them. Um, I had written like a feature version of Narco or like a feature version with hmm. like kind of set in that world. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's a fascinating world to me and like the music scene and kind of how serious it is and, you know, how artful it is, but also like the, the dangerous elements sort of mixed in it. It's just really compelling, you know? Yeah. And it's interesting because for example, a lot of the elements that uh, you have mentioned uh, we can find that in this case here in Mexico in in in, in the in feature films that we have, we have in here. However, the, the, it's it's always um, uh, delightful to find different sensibilities about the uh, same topic because the, the vision that we always have, and this is perhaps a, a complaint that I have in here for local uh, lo local filmmakers, is that uh, we usually tend to explore the same sort of narratives. And uh, if you get an international film festival like the Cannes Film Fest Festival. I already know that uh, certain uh, film directors, in this case from Mexico, are going to be in there. And uh, I always know what kind of films are, are they going to be releasing in there. And some of them are, are like really, really good. But for example, it's like, okay, we once again have 
a story about crime, a, a story about some people trying to cross the border, a story about... And these topics that are uh, always uh, present in, in the culture because are part of the culture. However, for me, it was really refreshing to find, in this case, a, a, an American filmmaker dealing with this and with a sensibility that in, in some cases, uh, it's actually... It helps, to, it helps us to understand the same topic because it's a fresher view, even though it's the same topic. So uh, you mentioned some of the influences and now we mentioned actually, let me just uh, put some of the narco corrido because right now uh, here in Mexico, there was also some sort of discussion because um, some of the public figures uh, have been mentioning that uh, they should be out loud, uh, the narco yeah. corridos. We'll because about that recently, yeah. Yeah, because they are like glorifying, in this case, uh, a style of life. However, uh, one of the things, and also you can you can look at it in, in the short film, is that, well, you have actions and you have consequences and you have well, like sure. the myth that is all around. What kind of research do you do? Uh, did you do in this case, uh, both for the short film Narco Corrido and also mm -hmm. for Low Life? I mean, yeah, even just narratively, like the mm -hmm. cause and effect and, and consequences of action has always been like a big thing with myself and, and our team, um, like when we're talking about this stuff. And I think a lot of that is, and especially low life, um, is, you know, the idea of like taking something that's normally seen as um, like exploitation cinema or exploitation mm -hmm. uh, characters, you know, and, and kind of like trying to ground them with, okay, there's actually like real world consequences, real world sort of issues wrapped up with them is just really interesting to me. I mean, with With narco, like, um, yeah, like, it's it's just it's fascinating to me that it's like it's so it's such a prevalent uh, and huge you know following of, of like a music scene, and it's still like here in the states at least not super well known, you know, or it's or if it is, it's kind of like oh wow that's crazy, and it, it is just the surface understanding of it, I think, and. Yeah, to me, it was just research wise, it was like, like I said, I felt sort of a kinship just in the sense of like, it's telling folklore stories the same as Johnny Cash or, you know, whatever, every other, you know, sort of thing I grew up listening to and or like hip hop or whatever. And like, so that was the initial like sort of and even, you know, I, I, I've said this before, like talking about it, but like um, when I first when I first uh, saw like music videos uh, for Narco Fritos, I was like, you know, it was taken aback by like, just how like the, 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 the violence and uh, the, the culture of it, the style of it with the uh, costumes and everything, you know, just, it, it was easy to um, immediately sort of like not laugh at it in the sense of like putting it down, but just laugh at like how almost absurd it was. And then, you know, as you start diving into it and like actually you know, listening to it, talking to, uh, we had a really cool um, group and uh, songwriters working on the short with us that, that are from here, but they they played in a couple of like bigger narco bands. Um, and yeah, it just, it was like a cool, to me, like getting past the surface was like part, like the big, the big sort of hurdle for me of, of like, okay, there's, a, there, it's funny, they're wearing crazy ass <laughs> cowboy, you know, like maniac outfits and they all they all kind of like look wild as fuck but then if you dig down into it there's like real art and real pain and real storytelling so yeah I, i feel like a lot of that is just it is that surface sort of reading of it and it's very easy to categorize it as like okay they're all just glorifying cartel violence or whatever but it's like yeah i think that there's more to it than that because it is storytelling and and it's it's music it's art you know Yeah, and it's like the primal way in that you can transfer information. Uh, it's always music, obviously, with words you, you, you yeah, can transfer story. Yeah, and it's been down traditionally, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I, I just, to me, that's like the way to talk about that stuff. And that's what's so interesting is if you're going to actually hopefully do something about the violence or talk about it or like get it out in the open, like that art's the way to do it, you know? 
Exactly. And uh, well, now let's talk a little bit more about the future pre presentation in this case, the main presentation, and let's go back to low life. As uh, we mentioned before, and uh, we actually saw uh, in part of the description in the trailer, uh, we can establish perhaps some easy references like, okay, it's a crime story, a narrative that can go backwards and, and forward in time. Oh yeah, it's Tarantino style, something like that. It's so some sort of, yeah. uh, of a cliche. However, I, I like to talk more about the, the, the characters because um, I really love the respect that you actually have, even though it's a comedy, it, it has a lot of, uh, of, bla of black humor elements. Uh, we can also say that uh, perhaps there are some elements of exploitation if we, we want to call it like that. Not exactly, but so, so, some references. Yeah, oh, playing with that, right? But for example, uh, did you base perhaps uh, some of the characters in some of the public figures? I know that it's a team of writers, but what were some of the references that you guys had uh, for the main characters in this case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of a mix of everything. Like I said, Monstro was definitely like like just those Santo movies um, or like... Could you, could that guy, I love the idea of Lucha, I mean, wrestling and Lucha in general, like these guys walking around, like going to the airport in a mask or going out mm -hmm. to dinner and they're wearing their mask and everything. Like that's just hysterical to me. So that mixed with, yeah, like, could we do like a down and dirty crime film with, with that character? And it felt like kind of surprising that people haven't super done a ton of those. I mean, there, there have been some recently, but um, yeah, I don't know, it's such a cool uh, world. And then... Yeah, with with Randy, with the guy. So you get, he's at, he's getting out of prison. He's got a swastika tattoo uh, from being in prison. It, that was actually like an idea for a sketch that we did. Um, the writers we did like just a scenario of like picking your buddy up from prison after years, and he's got a swastika tattoo. On. <laughs> what the and, hell? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was just that was like what was kind of fun about the whole project. And then uh, Crystal, Nikki's character, was sort of the same thing of like. Uh, we had done a short film back in um, in school, a couple of us of the group um, that sort of had that general premise of like, okay, your husband needs uh, you know, a kidney uh, and you're going to get it from your daughter or your uh, that you gave him for adoption. So that was like the general bones of like, again, a short we'd done before, but it was all, all three of them were kind of like, okay, let's build character first. And then kind of the scenario spun out of those. It's like, you get out of prison uh, and you have a swastika tattoo on your face and it's like the worst, like how do you keep making it the worst day of like the nicest guy in the world's life who has a swastika on his face or, so that was like definitely the fun of the whole thing was like less of like, I mean, we definitely had references of like, we talked about um, Wild at Heart a lot and I've actually just been reading a lot of um, uh, Barry Gifford stuff, you know, at the time and, so like those kind of like a little left of center crime films or, or crime books. Um, and yeah, just, I love those type of characters of like uh, Eddie Bunker books or any of those where it's just like, it's a part of it was like designed of for budget. Like how do we shoot a movie and, you know, make a feature and uh get it together but I mean a lot of that then was born out of okay well we want to make the most colorful characters possible in the most fucked up situation possible and they all <laughs> are kind of colliding you know yeah yeah but for example even though um, it, 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 you can get like some sort of a feel like uh, um, of uh, some of the character style from the Coen Brothers films because even though you can have some of the most ridiculous situations and you can get some of the characters that are like uh uh, the, the best example is, is uh, as you as you put it, you, you go and pick up your friend from jail and he just got a swastika. Well, he doesn't know exactly how the world uh, is working uh, after all the time that he has been in jail. However, yeah. uh, you, you don't uh, ridiculize, uh, ridiculize him. Uh, you actually ha establish empathy in this case with the characters because uh, you have, as you mentioned, some storylines that are getting mixed and you got, for example, somebody who wants to keep and improve the legacy because he feels like he doesn't deserve. And in this case, somebody who wants to uh, improve his life, somebody who wants to start again. However, there are some elements that actually are used like dragging him down. In this case, it can be as, as simple as a tattoo. Um, but you also established that he has good intentions. Uh, he's one of the most uh, empathetic characters that I, that I found in the entire story because he's like, well, you know, I also got feelings. And that sounds like a joke, but actually it's a reality. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I was, it was it was really hard to pitch the movie in general, like initially when we were trying to get money and stuff, just because it was like, I was like, yeah, okay, it's it's not a cartoon, not you know these these aren't clowns, but also there is a a guy like with a swastika tattoo and like it's tragic and funny and like sad and kind of depressing and you, you got action stuff kind of all in between. So it was like, yeah, what does this fit into? And I was always pitching it as like, well, the genre, it sounds pretentious, but it's like the genre is life. And it's like, how do you actually get like all facets of life in with all different characters and, and where they go through. And it's really just, to me, that's just, that's like the best stuff that you can get emotionally out of characters, out of the story. And like, yeah, hopefully by the end of it, it's like they've gone through like, I mean, the worst day of anyone's life collectively and they come out on the other side, you know, better for it. And so, yeah, I don't know. It was, it, thank you for saying all that. It was like fun to me to like, of can we, and that was a big challenge with the writers as well from Jump was like, and we make you like a, swast a guy with a swastika tattoo on his face. I mean, that's the most heinous, you know, symbol ever. And then it's like, but then you start kind of walking a mile in his shoes and like, and being, you know, along for the ride with him. And then uh, he doesn't turn out to be so bad. So, you know, and then on and on with everybody. It was like, we start, we tried to start them at their lowest sort of either physical or emotional points or doing something evil and then like, you know, can they be redeemed and truly redeemed and not just like, okay, the movie's over now. So we got to wrap this up kind of deal. <laughs> and uh, well, um, so some of the other things that uh, I want to, to talk about is that uh, we, we have uh, talked a bit about the characters. We have uh, talked about the dynamics in there. Uh, however, um, some time has passed since the, since the cops concept was first conceived. Some time has passed since uh, it was uh, filmed, it was released. Uh, have, uh, do, do, do you think uh, that the panorama, in, in this case in the United States and in Mexico, in, in the border, has changed in a way? W will there be some elements that you think perhaps uh, we should change this because the panorama right now is different or it's pretty much the same as, as when you were first? Uh, with yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I feel like we were like right ahead of the curve of like, what was coming with you know like our villain is basically trump and here we are you know <laughs> like so yeah it's interesting it's it's like um i ask myself that a lot of like even like the stuff i'm working on now or like projects you know trying to get going or coming up or whatever is like like yeah how much change are you really affecting or you know is that your job to do that or whatever it is like if it is just I feel like what's cool about this is we were definitely um, like finger on the pulse of what, what was happening. And unfortunately, like the fallout of like my worst fears imaginable is like kind of we're in the, we're in the throes of that. But, um, you know, that was always the big thing. And even and, and it kind of changed as we were shooting too, like per like from the script. But it was like, you know, we always wanted to be like, OK, it's it's low life you're reveling in kind of, or you're like wallowing kind of and how much how low all these characters can kind of like fall but like you know that there is some light in the tunnel and like and every all these characters that are from like opposite ends all kind of working together to, to like take this motherfucker down was like yeah, i'm mm -hmm. really proud of like you know what we were saying with the movie and like hopefully that's what people can kind of take out of it yeah, and uh, let's talk a little, a little bit more about the, the the visual aspects of the film because, well, the, the, the style is very characteristic, and uh, I, I remember that the, um, it was like three three weeks ago, four weeks ago, that at least here in Mexico, uh, one sort of meme was really going around, and it was like. Um, showing how in the United States, Mexico, it's looked at. And it's pretty much if you add a, a, a different color filter, that's Mexico uh, as seen as oh, yeah, the yeah, Americans. 
<laughs> like it's in as Mexicans. Or the yellow, yellow filter. Or exactly. <laughs> you, you can see it in, in films like Traffic, for example, is one of yeah. the best <laughs> examples in there. And uh, well, it's kind of funny. Well, if I modify the light that I have in here, perhaps I can get to that. To that. Yeah, are you really in Mexico, man? Come on. Oh, man, you discovered me. I am actually a little bit more northern. All right. <laughs> However, you, you take some of the elements in this case. Well, uh, when I say you, I mean the, the, the entire team for, for this film. Uh, and you take some of the um, uh, some visual elements, some visual cues that are really representative, and then you adapt it for the story, which is obviously the, the best way to do it. We have already spoke about El Monstro. Uh, however, uh, for one of the posters that uh, we find from the film, uh, you have the religious element in here. Uh, perhaps uh, some of the most conservatives uh, uh, will think that this is something offensive. However, uh, I find it that it's actually a really good representation because you are mixing some of the... Uh, part of the belief and um, um, part of the of, of the mixing that we have in this case in the culture. Can you tell us a little bit about the ideas for this kind of iconography that we are uh, having in the film? Yeah, I mean, the iconography stuff is really interesting to me of like, and, and it is visually like that was an idea we had after the film, um, after we shot it, but it was like, because that was the poster that we ended up doing for the um for the festival run, mm -hmm. uh, Florian Bertmer did, who's, he's incredible. So, I mean, a lot of credit goes to him for that idea, but it was, um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like part of the whole thing of, like we said, Mon or you said before, like with Monstro and his, uh, and his shrine to his father, you know, obviously playing with like religious imagery that way. And the movie itself, you know, starts with uh, like, Stations of the Cross, almost like you know, <laughs> intersected, and so yeah, I feel like that stuff probably more seeped into the movie and and like sort of cultural artifacts of, of of the world more so than like you know us designing it. But it is it is interesting, even you know, like in in hindsight of like how much of that stuff I feel like is kind of subconsciously buried within like storytellers and, and even just when you're in this world or talking about this world, you know? Mm, all right. Um, the idea of like, yeah, like, uh, like I just love the idea of a, of a luchador being a sainted figure. Like, I feel like that kind of says it all, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's not that far from, from reality. And after that, for example, we, we talk a little bit about, um, storytelling and, and the place that music has, for example, in, in uh, to transmitting, uh, stories in, in Arco Corrido. But also, for example, wrestling is a, it's a, a, a another way that, in this case, you can transfer the stories. You always have the battle between good and evil. And, for example, at least uh, in some matches, you know that evil uh, cannot win unless they cheat. Uh, so the, the, the yeah. good always will prevail. However, when you take these basic elements and you put it, in this case, in something more like the real world, when you have to fight, in this case, crime some, some some of the scenes and actually the beginning of the film is really sordid it's uh, something really really hard to if you have been near this kind of uh, situations uh, you you find some elements that are actually really scary you have a uh, trata de blancas you have a uh, human traffic you have uh, uh, the way uh, in that some of the characters actually deal with human beings uh, just as if they are merchandise so it's something that is really really hard however and this is my next question how, how do you find, um, can we say it, a balance between uh, including some of these elements that are like really, really hard to, to, to work with and also add some some elements like comedy, black comedy, uh, black humor, so it's not as heavy, so the, 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 the viewer is not just rejecting what it's watching on the screen. How can you find this kind of uh, balance? Yeah, I mean, that was really important was even just, and that was a big challenge was even to find uh, the balance of tones even on set, like, scene to scene as we were shooting but like yeah that again that was a really important thing to me and and the, a lot of the team was just like you know if we're going to show something super horrific like that especially open the film with something mm -hmm. that horrific i feel like it sets an expectations of a certain type of stakes which is good and it's like you know by design it's like okay now we're going to go sit with i mean the most colorful character, a red mask on his face, you know, for the entire film, um, and kind of step away from uh, that sort of a reality to 
you know, something a little bit more like quote unquote cartoony into, yeah, then we go into to Crystal's um, story. I mean, the film itself is segmented into sections. I should have mm -hmm. said that before. So it's like we get little uh, vignettes of, of everyone's story until they kind of all co collide in the end and all the storylines sort of meet up. But uh, yeah, we go from Monstro to, to Crystal's story. And I feel like that's like almost like the most emotionally draining, you know, section. And it's like, okay, we always joked uh, when we were shooting it, like, uh, okay, send in the clowns now. We got Keith and Randy to come in and kind of, like, you know, like, uh, lighten it up a little bit. So, yeah, I don't know. It, it was funny. is like you mentioned storytelling, like, even with wrestling. Like, we talked a, a lot about, like, the fight scenes of them being kind of designed as, as sort of, like, I mean, that's some of the best, like, storytelling, action storytelling, you know, ever is, like, the, the moments of like, okay, the low point or they're all hopes lost or whatever. And now the big turn, or, you know, we have kind of like a dual fight between uh, Monstro and the ice guys and Teddy and, and uh, Nikki or Crystal's character or Crystal Nikki's character is like fighting like the head ice dude. Who's like the mini boss basically. So it's like, <laughs> kind of like we definitely pull from a lot of different sort of ideas of stories to, to, mash it all up like video games and and wrestling and uh so, some people joke like i mean we're basically doing like a dungeon and dragons campaign where it's like everyone comes together by the end of it <laughs> like, like a big dragon or whatever so yeah i don't know but, but, but that to me is like the fun part of of narrative and you know growing up reading comics or again listening to like folk music or very like story driven music you know and um uh, movies and cartoons and video games, everything in between. Like it, the fun thing to me is to be able to kind of pull from all that stuff and st steal it. Will basically. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, something interesting here because, well, right right now, uh, if you're working in any media, not not only on, on movies, TV, or uh, pretty much, uh, you have to to kind of combine or, or to have presence on different media. And, and in this yeah. case the story and the characters and we're looking uh, in this case a vignette where we have a uh, teddy a crystal randy a uh, monstro um, and uh, some uh, those are some characters that actually can work as archetypes that you can translate really easily uh, i don't know like to a comic book for for example uh, mm -hmm. uh, because they are really representative of different aspects however they, they are not empty and once again we mentioned this before the way that you can uh, feel the characters the needs uh, the, 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 emph the empathy that you establish with them is something that actually makes you believe that they are like, uh, yes, they can be ridiculous, but actually they are all ridiculous people. It's, so it's something that you feel like closer to you. So yes, yeah. and we all, yeah, we're all ridiculous people, you know. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I, I, I just love, again, it's like, yeah, El Monstro, I mean, he, he, his first scene, uh, he gets called a clown and he's like immediately, you know, up in arms and it is like it's easy to just instantly categorize that person that you see uh in that in whatever way like you can kind of just like uh throw him in a box or whatever but you know like as soon as we start learning his story in that first scene like the context has changed we have we have some idea of like what his life's been and what his struggles been and it humanizes him and you know, I think part of that's definitely uh, the actor, uh, Ricardo Zarate, is like incredible to be able to emote that much and play a whole character uh, behind a mask. But, you know, just the fact that he becomes like the mask almost melts away and he becomes a person before our eyes is like was the trick and what we always try to kind of do again and again. And it's like, you know, Crystal starts with like we meet her early on and, you know, she's like victimized from the beginning. But then I, I feel like the first time you meet, you truly meet her and you hear kind of her plan, it's ter it's terrifying, you know, it's shocking of like what she's kind of planning to do. Um, El Mantra is the same thing. He kills somebody within the first, like, mm -hmm. you know, five minutes of meeting him. And then Randy's got uh, the, the greatest hate symbol known to man on his face. So it's like everyone like, you know, kind of starts at the bottom of the hill in a fun way narratively and you gotta make them climb it. Exactly. If, uh, after all, it's like uh, 
uh, perhaps some of the complaints that we can uh, we can see right now and once again for television for cinema for any kind of characters is that uh well but i don't want my characters to have this kind of de uh, of, of problems or this kind of uh, defects but well after all if you have a perfect character from the beginning you pretty much don't have a lot of, of uh, room yeah. to go yeah it's a limitation however it's better when you have actually a space to grow in this case for the personality for yeah. the challenges and uh one of the ways that i loved once again about the, in this case the monster is the way that um you mix the way that he can uh confront situations and then pretty much he just black up uh blacks out and pretty much everything is resolved and he doesn't even know how it happened <laughs> however you have this inner rage that is like yeah. really dangerous but it's also kind of comical because when uh, how, how the fuck did i actually fix this problem in this case but well yeah <laughs> yeah and, and what all that i mean the horror that that entails it's almost like you know uh uh like having like yeah, seizures or something like you just black mm -hmm. out and like you wait i mean he at one point in the movie he wakes up like blocks away like where did mm -hmm. he go how did he get there and then yeah i love like you know a, a obviously like that was a, a a production conceit like kind of a fun way around like we didn't have a ton of money to watch him do break shit but i feel like no matter what that would have been boring anyways and it, it's so fun to me that like we keep teasing that, teasing that, and then the big last payoff is like, oh, I actually probably didn't want to see him doing that stuff in the first place anyways. <laughs> like once exactly. I'm actually sitting here watching him, you know, smash someone's face to pieces, literally. So <laughs> Yeah, and actually it's what it, you went for, I guess, audience. <laughs> yeah, and it leaves you to the imagination, so it can be as horrible as uh, you can imagine. Yeah. So <laughs> Okay, so we're pretty much uh, about to end uh, this transmission, uh, but I don't want to do it before mentioning a couple of things. First of all, if people, if you want to to know more about this movie, as I mentioned uh, before, it's really easy. Just go to lowlifethemovie.com. There you will find uh, pretty much all the information, also links for social media, for the Twitter account, for the Facebook page. And uh, in case that you are wondering why I am recommending this film, once again, I mentioned before, but it was in my top 10 for the Cinefil Cinefiles, the dossier that uh, me and some friends from the film cryptic uh, group uh, do year after year. And uh, believe me, uh, I, I, I heard this film uh, uh, when it was being recommended in uh, one British podcast. I don't remember if it was the Little What Lies podcast or the Empire Magazine podcast. However, it, it grabbed my attention. They, they gave a very good recommendation. And I mentioned to, to Ryan before that I had to, to go to the uh, lower circles of hell to get a copy, a digital <laughs> copy. However, you don't have to do that. As it should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it actually, some of the characters uh, come from that place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can see Teddy like bootlegging the movie. <laughs> uh, but but there to have it. If you if you want to just receive it and be uh, have a clean conscience, you can actually get your copy. This is a legal copy. Don't worry. It's actually uh, it's not signed. But uh, perhaps Ryan can do a virtual signature in there if, if I pass it in here and he yeah. <laughs> or something um but uh, it's one of the films that i really enjoyed last year because it was really fresh it was uh well it was refreshing the way that the story storytelling was being uh, shown in there and also if you are of the kind of people Thank that no, and I really love it, man. And once again, thanks, uh, thanks for your time. But also, if you are uh, in the audience, one of the people that believes that if it's in Rotten Tomatoes or in Metacritic and it has a really good grade, then you should watch it. Well, guess what? If you go to Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 91%. Boom. So there you have it. Uh, we only paid like three three critics to, to get us up over 90, so we're fine. Yeah, the, the rest were Chinese boots or something like that, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> so there you have it. You have the recommendation. Once again, you can find it really easily on, on, on legal means. And uh, you can get more information uh, in the, the the official page from the site. In case that people wants to to get in touch with you, uh, Ryan, uh, you have also social network accounts, right? Yep, I'm just at Ryan right up there or... Out. there <laughs> there uh, yeah ryan prouse my name for all my social stuff so and then like you said low life's uh all low life the movie exactly there you can find it and uh, believe me ryan's such a really nice guy after all he he accepted to be in, on on this place and believe me i i was really delightful it Yo, was really you. delightful this awesome. this time I, I watched a couple of the episodes they're really fun 
Ah, no, actually, one one question. Do you know the guy? Do, do you know the guys from uh, Top Knock Detective? I have Aaron McCann and passing, but I haven't. I don't know them. I know the Endless guys. Did you do? Wait, you didn't do one of them, did you? you or uh, Watch Colero? Uh, neither, yeah, also from Watch Watch Colero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I mentioned because, and also a uh, uh, big shout out to to the to the Top Knock Detectives crew because yeah, they're, all, they're good guys. Though. I do. I've met them like in passing, but we're not like buds or anything. Yeah, and, and I asked that because I, I saw that you guys are following each other, so it was like, ah, perhaps they are from the same group or from the at least from the same generation. Because it I, was kind of the like it was a really cool. I mean, like you said, it's my first film, and it was such a cool experience to go do like the festival circuit, and that really felt mm. like. Yeah, that's when you meet yeah just so many cool people you know? <laughs> all right so well uh first of all uh once again thank you ryan it was uh really delightful it was a wonderful yeah, time you. that we had and uh thank to you all people that uh, who are watching he in here thank you very much for your time i hope that you enjoyed this uh, this conversation we will have uh, some uh, other shows in the in the in the following weeks i will let you know uh as soon as we have the the times and the guests uh, aligned in there and uh, thank you for uh, watching this. Thank you for supporting to all the people who are going to patreon.com slash churros y palomitas where uh, it's it's sort of like the tip jar where you can just uh, leave the change and I will try to use it uh, for a good cause. Like in this case, having interviews with the people who is behind uh, these wonderful films. Thank you. And once again, thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you. All right. Da -da 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 -da.